Um, our webinar today, databases and SQL, or SQL and databases. We a few little things we want to look at. We're going to discuss what a database is, for those who potentially haven't used them before. Um, there are different types of databases, increasingly so these days. Um, we're going to answer the question, when the desktop isn't enough. This is a, uh, a common question I'm asked by people who say, well, why do I need to use databases? Why can't I just use Python or R to do this kind of work in? Um, and then we're going to have a look at SQL itself, just a very simple introduction to SQL, only a tiny little part of what SQL can actually do. But it's probably by far the most important part, especially from your point of view, of trying to analyze data in, from within a database. Um, then we're going to sort of, the last two parts are really by way of demonstrations. We look at how you can actually access a database. Uh, in various different ways, and um, starting with a, a GUI type interface, and then we'll look at some of these programming languages that you can use, or different ways of accessing the database itself. So what is a database? Any collection of data, you can call it a database if you like. So here's a collection of data, but probably you wouldn't really think of that as a database. One of the things about a database is it has to be structured in some way so as to facilitate the retrieval of the data in it. So you've got to be careful how you put the data in to make it easy to take the data out. And in most cases, you won't want all of the data that's in the database. You might only want a very small part of it. There are different types of databases, um, but they all do essentially the same thing. They're all there to store data in such a way as it makes it easy to retrieve them. Not all of the databases or database types are going to store the data in the same way as each other, but a lot of the time you don't really care about that. You're only interested in being able to retrieve the data that's in the database. There are, uh, well, sometimes we don't care, most times we don't care. But there are some things which it can affect. It can affect the efficiency of the queries that we use to access the data. And in some ways, it can affect how we write the queries. But certainly for what we're looking at this afternoon, we're, we're, we're not interested in these things. They're not going to be relevant to what we're doing. The different types of databases, they're, they're broadly split into SQL or relational databases and no SQL. SQL. No SQL databases, bit of a, that shouldn't be there, I don't think. Um, we're going <coughs> to, excuse me, we're going to focus on the SQL databases and which, and where the data is actually stored in what we can think of as tables. Tables which have um, rows and columns in them, and the relational part can, is. <laughs> The relational part of the relational database is how you connect two tables together using some common key field. And unsurprisingly, SQL or relational databases use SQL queries to retrieve the data. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. But just to put it into context, there are other types of databases. These are normally referred to no SQL databases. And here, you're still storing data, but the data is stored is in terms of collections of documents. Now, if you look at the little little table at the bottom, that an SQL table equates to a no SQL collection, and an SQL table row is a no SQL document. So, what is it that makes a document different from a table row? And that is the the complexity of the structure of the data. If we have a table, it's simple rows and columns, whereas in a, a NoSQL document, the structure of the data can be a lot more complex. And as we're not going to be talking about them, I will go into um, explaining what those complexities are. But basically, complex is complex. Simple means tables with rows and columns in this context. Different documents in the same collection can also have different structures from the one next door to it, if you like. Whereas, again, in the, the relational database, all of the rows of the table have to have the same structure. Uh, and generally speaking, we don't use SQL queries to access the data. 
and there are some modern systems which allow you to use SQL to access NoSQL databases as well, which is another reason why it's good to know SQL. So tables, I probably already mentioned this, data and in relational database are arranged in tables. Think of these very much like the format you might see in a spreadsheet, rows and columns. Each column having its own column name. Um, internally, a database table is not quite the same as a spreadsheet, but as an image of what the table is like, if you want to imagine what it's like, it's a very, very good image. And here's just a picture of the image, an Excel spreadsheet showing the data that we, we are going to look at later on in our database. And you can see um, column names, these are the columns, and rows of data within the columns. Why relational database? Um, you can actually create a database which only has one table in it, and th there may be use cases for that. But generally speaking, a database will have multiple tables in it, and there will be some way of connecting these tables together using these keys and relationships between the keys. As I say, it's possible that they could be totally independent, but that would be a very unusual use case. So. This is an example of a paper sales receipt, which I found on the internet. There's various little sections of this. You imagine this would be commonly used pre-computer days in department stores where someone was buying something, so you needed information about the customer, customer order number, name, address, and so on. It, information about how they pay, paid for it, so like cash or cash on delivery, charge on account. I can't read the other two. And then the main body of, of this form is what they bought, how many they bought, how much, and how much they have to pay for it, or paying for those items. And then at the end, we've got a total, and a received by. Okay, so that gives you all of the information related to a particular sale in the department store. If we wanted to store this in a database, we would typically break it down into several tables possibly more than I'm actually showing here, but just as an example, we would have a table which contains customer details, names and addresses of the customers. Order details, so this is what they actually ordered, how many and so on, and the amount. The payment details, how they, were pay, how they paid for it, and the accounts details of, of how much they had to pay. And you can imagine these tables being used by different departments within the organization for different purposes. So the customer details up here, they could be used for sending, up where there's typically just the name and address of the customers, if you want to send them that your latest catalog. This is all, this is all of the information that you really need, names and addresses. The order details down here, well, who uses the order details? What you really want to know from this, or what this is really telling you, is how much stock you have sold. So the people in the warehouse who have to reorder the stock are going to be very interested about what's coming up here and the quantities and the descriptions, because they've got to reorder the stock into the store. Payment details, well, the account department want to know if it was cash, because you've got to balance the cash at the end of the day. Cash on delivery, if it's going to come in later, and so on and so forth. And again, accounts are going to be interested in total of the sales, how much money is coming into the store. Now, by the, so they all have their own little uses, but individually set up like that, they are a bit, um, well, they are of limited use. What we really need to be able to do is to relate a particular customer with what they ordered, how they wanted it delivered, and how much money did the store get. So this is where the relationships come in. What we need to do is create relationships between these three tables here and link it back into the customer details table. You possibly can't read that on the screen, but it says customer order number. So that's going to be a unique number there, and that number will actually also appear in each of these three tables down here. I not being show, I haven't shown it on the on the diagram because I just got this from the, the previous slide. 
uh, but each one of them will have the order number in there so for any one of these we can relate it back to the specific order and the customer number um, I, I mentioned that each of these have their own uses um, for different departments or different um, purposes depending on what you want to do the point about it being that if you just want to send someone a new catalog you don't need any of these tables if you're just interested in reordering stock you just need the details all the details table yeah so it's a way by splitting the data up into separate tables you can limit how much data you need to process to get the information you need and that's one of the um, key design elements of relational databases you only store data once and by breaking it up into tables you're hopefully going to reduce the amount of data you need to process it doesn't always work because one of the key things about a relation database are these relationships themselves which allow us if we need to to join two tables or three tables together to get a larger set, set of information so advantages of using tables um, small amount of data to manipulate I've just said and the security of the data uh, what I didn't make clear on the having split these out into separate tables um, a modern relational database would allow you to restrict who can see each of these tables so for example the people in um, publicity who are sending out the the catalogs but they, they, they have no need to know how much money your customer spent so you can hide that from them or stop them seeing it um, disadvantages is that it's slower to update because whenever you go if you go back again oops, to our original um, paper sales receipts all of the information was put onto that single sheet of paper whereas here I've now got to add bits of data into four separate tables so you can, it's easy to imagine how that's going to be slower to update um, and I've already mentioned that more complex queries may need data from more than one table which adds to the complexity of the query what is a desktop not enough what you need to remember is that databases can be very very large gigabytes millions of records quite easily and potentially they can be too big to store on your desktop your desktop has a it's a relatively small machine yes it's okay for browsing the internet and what have you but storing large databases is not really what it's designed to do yeah, another thing is that the data may, be not be, may not be yours anyway. It may be someone else's database who has allowed you access to it. You may only be interested in part of it, i.e. some of the tables or just part of some of the tables. Fortunately, we can make it easy to share databases. But we'll need to look at how um, the environment is constructed first. So. A database system, I put system in quotes because optional if you use the word system, it's not, typically it's not a single program like Excel is. The two main parts, you get the, the database engine itself, and this defines the database type. So by type there, um, not only whether it's an SQL or a no SQL database, but potentially also whether it's a um, um, an Oracle database or a MySQL da database because they will each have their own way of actually storing the data on on the disk and they need to know that because they need to retrieve the data so um, it stores the data on the, on the disk for you it needs to interpret and act on SQL requests that is the queries that you're going to send to it and then uh, having interpreted and acted on the, the request it's going to return the data from your queries all of that is the job of the database engine. The other side of this is, well, how are we going to communicate with this database engine? And we do this using the user interface. Um, we can communicate with the database engine, and we can do this in many different ways. 
Um, all database systems come with their preferred user interface, usually some kind of GUI interface. But there are other ways of doing it, as we will see later on. So imagine um, Microsoft Access. Now, this is, in fact, very much like um, Excel in that it's, it, it comes as a single package. And when you install Microsoft Access, you get a GUI interface and you get a database engine. You can't really install a database engine without the GUI, but you can actually access the database engine without the GUI. It comes as a single package. That's that one. But some of the larger database systems, SQL Server from Microsoft, Oracle, MySQL, they come with a GUI, yes, and they get a database engine. And you see this just arrow just to show there's a separation between the two. They are two separately installed items. Again, if you're doing this on your desktop, you would typically want to install them both, but you don't have to. You install a database engine without installing the GUI. So GUI database engine, we don't need to have the GUI. We can provide some other means of talking to the database engine. Um, anything that can connect to a database engine you will do, and there's lots of things which will do that. So here's a selection of typical database types, uh, MySQL Server, uh, MySQL Oracle, SQLite, which we'll be using later on, and Microsoft's SQL Server. And the point about this is we may want to talk to any of these databases from, say, R or Python or Excel or SPSS and lots of other um, third-party programs as well, programs and applications. All we need to do is have a means of communicating between the two. Um, the standalone GUIs um, are, are available. These are only a very small selection. Um, the MySQL Workbench, unsurprisingly, is, comes with MySQL. DB Browser for SQLite is a separate product that is designed to work with SQLite here. Um, DBver work as far as I know works with all four of those databases and it's a project which is designed uh, or sells itself if you like and I'm saying I can connect to any database that you care to mention. And we also have sophisticated text editors like um, Microsoft's VS Code and they provide very rudimentary type interfaces in the database where you can still run queries but it doesn't have many of the um, the useful benefits that a GUI would have for you, or would provide you with. Uh, so that's that that separate. I've got a message in my audio sessions been hopefully I'm going to continue to say okay. oh it's reestablished. Okay. Um so far we've seen that the 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 access interface, the GUI, and the database engine is separate or can be separated. They're not the same thing. They don't have to, not only can they be separated, you don't have to have them on the same machine. The GUI could be on your desktop or laptop because that's where you're going to write your SQL queries. And the database engine could be on a far, far larger machine, hundreds of gigabytes of memory, which is obviously going to um, facilitate very large databases for you to use. So if we look at this in pictures, we have the GUI and the database engine. That was the like, um, MS Access type in, environment. We can have the GUI on the, on the desktop. We can have the database engine on the server. And the point about this separa separation of the desktop GUI and the database on the server is that in, 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 it's like in real size, this is your GUI down here on your desktop which is just a typical desktop size, but the database engine could be on a very, very large machine, allowing you to process very, very large databases. And of course, the thing is that you're just writing this, the SQL query on your little GUI, that's just text. You send it off to the database engine, 
processing a database of perhaps hundreds of millions of records, but if, if your query only returns 100,000 records, then that's all that has to be sent back to the GUI on your desktop. So you can use this for the large storage and processing, and then just return to your GUI on your desktop the data that you want. And when I say GUI on the desktop, it doesn't have to be the GUI because it could be any of the other interfaces that we saw, R or Python and so on. So that's like the background of SQL databases. So now we're going to start looking at some SQL itself. Uh, two basic types of SQL commands, DDL statements and DML statements. DDL statements, data definition language, they're used to create databases and the tables within the databases and, and generally manage the environment. And, in, and we're not going to be terribly interested in them because we're going to start with a pre-populated database. The data manipulation language, DML, that's used to deal with the actual data in the tables. So we're only interested in, in DML statements, I've just said, and really only one of these. There are, in fact, four basic ones, create, which in SQL terms is referred to as insert, read, which is a select statement, which is the one that we are going to be looking at, uh, update a record, delete a record, or a row from a table. And these are collectively referred to as CRUD statements, C-R-U-D. We're going to go, in, in demonstrations, I'm going to start in a minute or two, we're just going to assume that we have some data in our database. I'll show you how we got it in there um, when, I, when I show you around the interface. Um, but so all we're really interested in is the select statement, reading data from our database or our tables in the database. Um, this, this may seem very limiting, but the reality is that most of your time on database work will be writing select queries and, and getting data out of the database. After all, you, you create the database only once, you put the data in there only once, but you can query it as many times as you like. So what can we do with a select statement or select query? Um, we can get, take specific columns from a table, tables. We can ask for specific rows from a table. We can add new columns to the output of a query. I'll come back to that in a minute. And um, that output can be based on existing columns or on a variety of built-in functions. Uh, we can create aggregations from the rows in a table by grouping the values in more, one or more columns. And we can produce sorted output based on column values and so on. So you see a lot of these select specific columns, i.e. not all of the columns, specific rows, i.e. not all of the rows, create aggregations, summing things together. These are all things which are actually going to reduce the size, the amount of data being returned to you. What we need to know a couple of things. Nothing in a select statement can affect the underlying data in the tables. So in that previous slide, the reason I've put that, whoops, the reason I've put that in bold is it's only, when we're adding new columns, it only affects the output of the query. It doesn't affect the underlying data in the tables. Uh, the, output, the output of a select statement is always, <laughs> excuse me, always a table, even if it's only one row and one column. Um, one of the very common things you, you query on a table is how many rows are there in this table. The answer is going to be just a single value, but it's still a table with one row and one column in it. Um, various ways of saving the output from a select query, you can either save it within the database as another table or, or what's called a view. Um, we can think of these as being quite synonymous, though internally they're very different. Um, a view, again, just looks like a table with rows and columns. Or we can write it to an output file, typically CSV, because that naturally lends itself to rows and columns. Right, the demo. Rest of the web 
of the webinar to be able to the demonstrations. Uh, we can look at a GUI, and this is just a GUI. I'm going to use DB Browser for SQLite because that's where our database is. Um, but there's lots of things about it which are very common, and I'll, I'll point them, them out, uh, common to other GUIs. And then we're going to create and run some select queries. Um, the data set we're going to use to do these on, i.e. the data set I've put into our database, uh, comes from the, the UK Data Service. It is SN7613, the census microdata. And I picked this one because uh, it's not, well, well, I basically picked it because it's got over half a million rows in it, which is a decent size to be working with a, a demonstration database. Okay, so I need to just come out of that and go into DB Browser. This is the um, this is uh, an application that you can download. It's it's freely available. You can install it on your own machine, and it's called DB Browser for SQLite. It's designed to allow you to manipulate um, SQLite databases. And when you load it up, it looks something like this. I've I've tailored this slightly for my usage, but um, essentially you have these little tabs across here, and the one we're going to spend all our time in is this execute SQL, which allows me to, to write an SQL statement in here. The results will appear in this middle panel down here, and some messages at the bottom. I'm just going to make, just change the size of that. Um, the first thing I'm going to want to do, though, is to open, open the database. And um, an SQLite database is, in fact, just a file with a, a prefix of typically DB or SQLite. So it's a single file, and just click Open, because I've created this one previously. And it, when it opens it up, you can see on the left-hand side here, what's under DB Schema, it's got five tables in it. One, two, three, four, five, and not much else. Okay? Um, if I want to see what's in any of those tables, I can go to the browse data and have a look at the table contents. And it will show me what's in the table. Very numeric data, this particular example. Um, all of these things showing the, 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 um, what is in the, the tables, list of the tables, the column names, what have you, being able to browse the data easily. These are things which are very common to all of the, the um, the, the database GUIs. They'll all do them slightly differently, obviously, but, but the, the, these are things which are always going to be there. And also, this execute SQL allowing you to write your own queries. Uh, in addition to writing your own queries, you can actually also load a file of pre-written queries, which I'm going to do here. Um, select SQL. And in here, I've got just a little file of SQL queries, and we're going to, these are what we're going to run, um, some of them anyway. Um, so this is our first little image, first little seeing of um, SQL. So I'll just go through the first few quite carefully, and then we'll look at some of the more complex ideas. So the first thing I said you could do is we can select columns from a table. I think. This table here, CMT, CMT 11 mod, is the table we're going to use most of the time. The star here means I want all of the columns. Okay, so it's not really making any smaller here. Um, the green at top here with the two dashes, this is the how you indicate a comment in SQL. So two dashes means that anything following that to the end of the line is just comment. So effectively ignore it. It's just for your documentation purposes. This line at the bottom here, limit 10, is um, it's not strictly SQL. It's it's commonly implemented as part of SQL, but it, it's one of the things, one of the statements or clauses, if you like, um, which can change between one database system and another. So for example, in MySQL, it would be written as limit 10. If I was using Microsoft SQL Server, I would say top 10. Okay, so that changes very slightly. But the majority of the SQL that we're going to see, the select and the from, is the same 
regardless of what database system you're going to be using, SQL database system. The semicolon at the end is just to delimit the end of that statement. And that's there principally because these files can, as you can see, can have multiple statements in them. So if I select my first SQL statement, a uh, little run button up here, select star, select everything from that table, but only give me 10 rows. So in this middle section down here, let's make it smaller, let's make it a bit smaller, we'll see all 10 of them. You can see I've got 10 rows coming back and all of the data in that table. What we really said though, we want to be able to just pick selected columns. So here, rather than using the star, I've actually in given a list of the column names I want it to return. And now I've still only I've still got the limit 10 in there, but now I've only got the three comments I explicitly requested. Just to point out that the, the star really does mean all of the columns. You can't use it as a, a wild card as you can do on some systems. So if, if I try to run that, I get all oh, red lines at the bottom saying you can't do that. Syntax error. How you write your SQL statements is entirely up to you in the sense that they are free format. Um, yes, you've got to have your select and your from. Um, you've got to separate the columns with commas and don't forget the semicolon at the end. But other than that, it doesn't matter if they're in uppercase or lowercase. Let me make sure there. Um, it doesn't matter if I have got multiple rows or I could have written this all on one long row if I wanted to. That doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's not interested in the white space in the query. Um, one thing I point out about all of these GUIs, they, they understand the databases that they're meant to be um, operating on. So what it will do is, if I start typing in select, see how I get to select and when I put the T on, it knows it's a select sim and it changes the color. And most of the systems will do this, um, a little bit of help to help you with the syntax. It understands the syntax, it knows how to do it, and it will color code various things. And if you're looking at this um, column here, which is a, is a column called sex, the reason it is in green, that greedy color, is because I've also got a table called sex up here. And again, because it's not interested in uppercase or lowercase, it sees it as a table name, which is slightly confusing for us, and so it does get that slightly wrong. But other than that, it's there, the, the color coding is there to help you get the syntax correct. So that's how we get um, specific columns. What if we want specific rows? Well, this introduces the where clause, and we say, um, the first part is very much the same, select from, but now we're going to, ask for specific value in one of the columns where gender equals female. If I run that. Now here I didn't, I've, I've removed the limit now so you can see at the bottom here that has returned 289,000 records and you see the genders are all, all female. Um, the types of qu um, Expressions you can use, I've got equality there, um, greater than here, and you can have a whole host of other things. So a more complex example here, where I've got ands and ors to um, make a more complex um, expression, um, and I can use brackets to enforce um, how they're interpreted, so making sure that these ors are, are go together and not the ands. So it's a way of enforcing precedence of the expressions. Um, as I said, all the usual operators for greater than, less than, and so on. And you can use and in order to add them together. So here we can make a far more complex query and run that. And now, uh, let me just I run that one correctly. Um, so if we look at these, um, gender still equals female, region is less than three, well I've got ones down there, I have twos later on, strictly less than three, and a range for the age groups. 
there are other operators you can use which can help you um, simplify the, 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 the coding of the queries. So in this example here, I want age group greater than two, should be greater than two, and less than or equal to six. I can run that and get the answer. But rather than doing that, I can actually say age group between three and six, using the between keyword there. Okay, and there's also an in keyword here where I can say in and then in in the brackets what values I want. So I'm doing exactly the same query again, hopefully getting exactly the same answer. So there's other keywords you can use, and they're just really there to help you simplify um, the way you write the um, the, exp the expression in the where clause. Um, we've also got um, the like keyword, which is operating on using wildcards now, um, the percent sign there means um, any number of characters. So here, if I run this uh, for the region name, I've got northeast, and if I go down towards the bottom of that, I've got northwest as well. Okay. One important thing about um, data, which you, you may have come across in your other little adventures with data, is that you can't always guarantee things are the right size and people have to put spaces in the data and what have you. So one of the built-in functions is this thing called trim, which allows you to, or allows the system to remove any spaces at the beginning or end of, of um, a value in a column. So you see this trim used quite a lot to help clean the data. In this particular case, it doesn't make any difference because it's nice clean data coming from the UK data service. So that's not going to make any difference. Um, I'm looking at the length of the region name and then the length of the region name after I have trimmed it. And if I run that, they're both, I think they both always come out as 10 because it's nice clean data. But um, having extraneous spaces can be a bit of a problem with data. So you tend to use that quite a bit. And finally, we can sort the data on any of the, the um, column names we want, any of the column names which are mentioned in the select at the top here, that is. And they'll just come out by default in ascending order, but you can change that to descending if you want to. There's an example of using it in descending order. Okay, so the, the basic things we can do with the select statement, uh, it just occurred to me I haven't done any aggregations there. Never mind. Um, basic select statement. So the next thing I want to show you is that this has all been done using this GUI, which is very useful when you're, you're, you're practicing and you, you want to try out your queries and what have you. But you don't always want to access um, the database from a GUI because um, typically the, the results are just written down in the table here. Yes, there is functionality which allows me to um, save the results view and I can export it as a CSV file if I want to. But a lot of times we actually want to use the database system to do the heavy work of manipulating the data and then have it returned to some other system. So um, leaving that, if I just I'm changing there, I'm just going to show you how we can access our database system from Excel. So this is just standard um, Excel from Office 365. I'm just going to open a blank uh, uh, workbook and in here I'm going to go to data oops, data and get data from other sources and in this case I'm going to use a Microsoft query okay I could use ODBC but I'm going to use Microsoft query and what this will do is is um, bring up a list of um, data sources which are available to me and the one I want to use is this SQLite data source here. I click on OK. 
and then it's going to come up and say, well, okay, so we want SQLite, but what is the database name? So here I can just browse to where my database is, much as I had before when I opened it in DB Browser. So that's my database. I'm going to open it. I'm going to click on OK. And this is a, a Microsoft query little bug, which I'm going to say OK to there. Just do that. This should come up straight away, in fact, show me all of the tables. So from this, you can conclude that even at this point, or, or by this time, if you like, Excel has spoken to the, the database and the SQLite database engine and got from it a list of all of the tables. Okay. Um, if I click on, on, on any of the tables, I can see the columns I've got in them. If I select on the table, I can say, oh, I want all of the columns. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna, actually going to undo that and use one of the smaller ones, like the occupations just because it's a smaller table, and say, yes, I want that. And the next step will say, oh, um, do you want to filter the data? And you can say, um, well, ID, and then you can put conditions in there if you want to. So that's equivalent of writing a where clause. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, move on, and then say, do you want to sort it by anything? Well, no, I don't really. I just want to go on to next. And then I get the finish option, return the query to Microsoft Excel, uh, view the data or edit the query in Microsoft Query. I'm just going to click on this just to show you what that is going to produce. Clicking on the top one would just literally return it to the to the, the workbook here. I'm going to click Finish, and then Microsoft Query itself comes up. And you can see here now the data from the table, which I've selected. But if I go, if I click this SQL button here, you can see the SQL query, so you see the select and the from um, um, uh, clauses, and that is the SQL query that Microsoft Excel is going to send to the SQLite database engine in order to get the, query, the data to come back. Okay, I'm not going to bother changing that, but in theory I, I could just delete this and write a whole new query if I wanted to. So I'm going to cancel that and I'm going to click on the button here. Um, return data and it's just Excel saying where do you want me to put it and there is the data coming back from the table okay now in that case I was just taking all of the data but given that I had the options of creating a query of any type I wanted to you can still imagine this of, of writing or reading a database of millions and millions of rows a query which is just going to aggregate something or select certain um, fields and, and rows and just return something a lot smaller which is can be manipulated in Microsoft Excel. If I don't want to use uh, Microsoft Excel, um, if I wanted to use a, a programming language or something like that, um, or in this case Python I'm going to show you, um, no, it doesn't really matter if you know Python or not. The, the only things I really want to point out in this little few lines of Python code are these two I've, I've um, put in red here. Um, the first one is I have to connect to the database. And that's exactly the same as, as what happened when I opened the database file in the, in the GUI, in DB Browser. Exactly the same thing as I did when I accessed it from Excel. I have to say what database are, are you interested in. And the other one is this um, variable called SQL into which I just put in my standard SQL query. Select star from occupations. The rest of it is just Python code. But you can see at the bottom here how the data is returned. Exactly it's the same table as I've just shown you in Excel. So there's many, many ways of getting the data back from a database. You use a GUI typically when you're developing um, so you can see, you know, how the query, is the query going to work at all in the first place. You get the benefits of the color coding in the IntelliSense, which you don't get in either of the systems.